Hello everyone and welcome back. Another interesting one for you today. So here's the tooth. You can see that there's something going on on the mesial. You're guessing is, is the same as mine. It's probably a missed MB2. Here's what it looks like on the scan. So you can see it's involving both of those buccal roots. However, when we look up and down the scan, the palatal root actually looks very clean. And so what I'm going to do here is the it's kind of a strange concept, but the idea is a staged retreatment. So I'm only going to address the buccal canals. And you can see, I used my famous drawing of here's your missed MB2 that's causing it. And I'm gonna leave the palate alone. So let's go through the process here, starting off as always by flattening out that occlusion just a little bit because zirconia is super, super hard. You can actually see the sparks flying there. And the reason why sparks fly on these is because it is a metal. Remember that this is metal hitting a metal. So yeah, definitely needed a little more power there. More power! I started off with the air, um, went to the electric. I've already burned through one burr, and you can see here in a second, we're about to burn through another. So I'm going to take a quick aside as you see it heat up and talk about why that is. So we're going to have a quick clinical aside here to talk about zirconia. It's probably one of the most popular crown types right now, and so as endodontists, it's very important that we just understand that there are different types that you can have. Most of this is based off of a lecture I went to at the Spear Summit this uh the summer of 2023 with uh, Dr. Nate Lawson. As you guys know, I'm a big fan of his. He does amazing work and also really fun animations as well. So uh, that's where I got most of this information. And then also talking with my local prosthodontist kind of about this is where all this came from. So when we look at zirconia, there's two main types. We have tetragonal zirconia. There's the shape right there. And this is what zirconia has been for a long time in dentistry. If you think back to the original Bruxers, it's the, we put a marshmallow on top of a tooth and that's what we see here. This is the strongest type of zirconia. You can pretty much stand on top of one of these crowns and it's not gonna break because they're so stinking strong. But because of that, it makes it a little bit difficult to access through them and remove. You then have the cubic zirconia, which this one, you can see the crystalline structure is different. And most importantly, it is now translucent. And it's what makes those fake diamonds that we all know and love. Now, when we are looking at how they've kind of modified zirconia to be more aesthetic, what they do is they add a chemical to make some of that tetragonal zirconia turn into cubic and therefore be more translucent. That chemical is called yttria or yttrium oxide. You can see the chemical structure behind there. One yttrium uh, atom with a bunch of oxygen around the outside of it. And we add it there because it gives us more translucency. It's measured in a molar weight percentage. And so three mole percentage by weight is what goes into the old school zirconia like you've seen. Like I said, the Bruxer, that's probably the best known one out of them. Four mole will actually stabilize about 25% of the total zirconia into cubic. So these are a little more aesthetic. And then your five mole is going to stabilize 50% of the zirconia inside your crown to cubic. So these are the most aesthetic out of them. Now, what the heck is yttria and why does this matter? Well, when you're making your crowns, if you're a general dentist out there, they're going to label these as 3Y, 4Y, and 5Y. And that is going to respond correspond to the amount of yttria they've added to the zirconia to make it more translucent. This is a great paper that kind of goes through the whole idea of zirconia. It's from 2017. I'll drop a link below. It is a free download from uh, PubMed. But a lot of you are probably asking, well, I don't even know what type of zirconia I use right now. What, what's actually in it? And this is a very handy chart. There are more than this, since this was six years ago that this was published, there are far more zirconias out right now. And usually they're not going to <laughs> actually label if it's 3Y, 4Y, or 5Y. You'll see that sometimes the anteriors will be labeled as 5Y, sometimes anteriors will be 3Y, so vice versa. It can go all over the place. But what you do want you to notice there is your first generation, your ones and twos, the Lava Plus, the Brooks are full strength. Those are going to be 3Ys. And you can see that percentage there that less than 15% of cubic, that's why they look like marshmallows. That's why there's no translucency to these at all. And you compare that with your 4Y and 5Y, that's where you get the 25 and 50%. Now, for those of you asking, well, what crap type of material should I use? A, I'm an endodontist, so don't trust me. <laughs> but you can trust my buddy Johnny, who's a prosthodontist and has done work on this. What he told me is 3Y is just too strong. It, it, there's, there's no need to put that in there. You're, you're putting a way too strong of a material inside a mouth that doesn't have things that strong. 
if he's concerned about strength or if he needs to mask anything for the opaque, you know, if there's a discoloration in the tooth, he's going to be using a 4Y zirconia. And he said there really is no use for a 5Y either at this place because with lithium disilicate, you can bond those crowns and actually a Lawson's group showed that there is equivalence in the strength of a bonded lithium disilicate to a zirconia crown if it's cemented normally. Uh, bonded zirconia is still the strongest. So the, the kind of goal is bonding. So all of you are saying, Scott, why the hell are you talking about this? Well, if you noticed, I just blew through two burrs. And these are the two, these are specifically designed to cut through lithium disilicate or zirconia. And I use my 014 for the vast majority of cases. I actually just discovered this. Brassler, they weren't able to make an 012 in the round shape. However, they were able to make an 012 on this long skinny diamond as well. So I've started to use these on really skinny anterior teeth. You'll see these, these come up a little bit here, but that's the smallest diamond burr that I can get that actually accesses through these. And even still, <laughs> this is designed to cut through zirconia and you'll notice that it pretty much blew up almost as soon as I touched this tooth because this one is a three Y. There's no doubt about that. You can see it's, it's incredibly hard. I've already gone through two burrs here. And so what you're going to see me do is switch over to a different burr. This is when we first started doing having to access through these crowns, I noticed that it was impossible without electric hand pieces, but I did notice that a medium or even fine grit diamond seemed to be better than these coarse or super coarse diamonds. So for the, if you do see three Y, the really, you know, opaque zirconia, try using one of these. Um, this is the, I don't really pull this burr out too often, so this might be the first time you see it, but these are just from Midwest. Um, I get mine from Henry Shine. I'll, I'll put a link to kind of the numbers, but you just talk to your local rep. And they tend to work very well when nothing else does to get through these sorts of crowns. They don't work great on PFMs. I'll sometimes use it to start there, but you got the metal. Um, they, they don't work great on lithium disilicate. I tend to like my purple diamonds for that. But for these really tough 3Y style zirconia crowns, if you're having trouble, and I've already blown through, you know, $10, $15 of diamonds at this point just by exploding them, um, these work extremely well. So highly recommend. Uh, if you have any questions, drop a link below, but let's get back to the case. So as you can see, we're going to be using that blue stripe diamond and voila, it works. So sometimes, you know, even though something can be designed to work in a certain way, it doesn't always work out that way. And hopefully that little trick about looking at the opacity of the zirconia to discover which burr is going to work the best will hopefully help you out as well. So we finally got through the zirconia, as you can see, going to use that workhorse. I was not too bad. That was actually a pretty decent one, all things considered. The vocal lessons have been paying off. I know many of you are out there just hoping and waiting for me to fail, <laughs> but... <clears throat> At this point, cleaning everything out, removing the composite. I skipped forward a little bit there, so you don't have to see all of it. But that's where the gutta percha is. A little bit of it is still covered by composite here. So that's why I'm using that skinny diamond, just to unroof that. This is one of those cases where, you know, I don't normally do straight line access. But in a retreat, when you need to create that apical pressure, sometimes you do have to make the access just slightly larger than you would would were this a uh, you know, normal case, a, a first time in case. So uh, if you've ever noticed that my retreats tend to have slightly larger accesses, still small compared to like pathways of the pulp, as you can see, I don't think anyone called that a large access. That probably would have got me a fail in dental school. <laughs> um, but this way, you don't have to remove too much tooth structure. And at this point now, I'm going to be going after MB2. So you can see this is one that's going to take a little bit of time. The, the light brushing here, that's where MB2 starts, that little white dot. You'll also notice the assistant has the air blowing in there as well. I'm not worried about an embolism because there's we're, we're not painting at this point. So as having that air, as I'm troughing inside there, works out really nicely because then the dust will actually kind of go into the MB2 itself and help clean it out. So uh, I was able to get a little bit of a stick with that. And so now I'm going to be using the 1704 just to hopefully open up a little bit. Really didn't get much there. So uh, I tend to not try to waste too much time on one thing if I'm struggling with it. And just sometimes it's nice to just take a break. So that's what we're doing there. Moving over to the two buckles, as I showed in the comb beam, I'm going to dress both the MB1 and the distal buckle, but we will leave the palatal alone. You can see that uh, F1, it's such a nice burr for a file for this sort of thing. Spin it fast at 550, it heats up and pulls out that gutta percha. When it completely covers those, <laughs> uh, the flutes of the 
file, you do want to remove them at that point. That's what you saw me doing there. So we're going back in here. This is a lot of the work is just slowly troughing down. One of the residents asked how far I go. And I was always taught you want to go about three millimeters, give or take. Um, you'll see me switching over here to the EG3 as well, just to become a, a little bit more conservative. This was before I got the skinny workers. There we go. You, you, there's one in there. <laughs> before we got the skinny work horse burr, uh, I wanted to uh, so I, I'm, you can see it's slightly larger. It's a 014 instead of the 012, but you'll you'll uh, we have like five boxes of that to blow through before I can <laughs> start ordering the 012 in full time. But I do keep it in my office and bring it out for those tiny cases. Anyway, what we're doing here, just that light brushing motion is all you really want to do and, and kind of follow it. You can see the air is in there. It's a great trick. This is why having the side scope is so beneficial because the assistant, you can see I can work for an extended period of time and the assistant can still keep that air and keep everything in there. Um, I cut out a lot of the rinsing as well. There's usually rinsing between all of these, but this video is already getting long enough because it is two, you know, it's a two-step. Plus, I had to go on that little, you know, soapbox tr uh, talk about the uh, <laughs> zirconia types. But so cut out a lot of the rinsing here, but you'll want to rinse in between all of these either with water, you can use EDTA. And you can see now I'm getting a little bit more of a stick. Once you get that first two millimeters or so, that's when you can start to use your rotary files. Because remember, rotary files pull debris out. Look at how much debris is coming out from that 17 as I'm working down this. That's what you want to see. You can see I'm getting them probably about three, four millimeters, a little buckling in the file here just because it's it is still working pretty hard. One of the tricks you can do, you've seen me do this before, actually take the file down the other canals that are straight. The heat will actually re-straighten that file back out, and that's what I'm doing here. I also need to remove some more of the gutta perch in that area too. And you can see it pulled out that MB really nicely as well. Um, I think this was a cold lateral case based on kind of how the cones were looking. And usually if you can get inside there and just grab one, the rest of them come out because there's it, it's a bunch of small little individual cones at once. So now that we got the 17, I'm going to be taking the 2006 down and you want to use different tapers here. If I had a 2004, A, it really wouldn't do that much, but more importantly, it's going to create about the same size and you want to not overwork these files. So by using a 04 and then a 06 taper, you can change the area of the file that's getting worked up. At that point, really wasn't able to get too far down the MB2, uh, but I was patent in both of the buckles, so we went and got a working length for both of those, so I have an idea of how far roughly the MB2 is going to be. In general, if they do join up, they're usually going to be about plus or minus one millimeter, but remember, MB2s can be a lot shorter if they exit out more coronally to the side of the tooth. Um, I've seen them be three, four millimeters shorter than the MB1, and that's the actual length, just because they exit short. So it did try to get close to it if you can, if you're not sure, but using the apex locator is the best way. So uh, at this point, we're still working down, getting that 2006. I'm not really making too much progress here. As you can see, working length on this one, I think was 19 or 20, and I'm, I'm barely hitting the flutes there. So now I'm going to do some hand filing. A bunch of you have asked what the hand filing looks like. This is pretty much it. I'm doing a watch winding, slight pressure apically, and pulling back up. Um, I don't really do balanced force anymore. Uh, rotaries are really like pretty much taking care of all of that for us. But it is important if you are learning how to do root canals that you do learn the hand filing process because you do need it every now and then. In my case though, place it using the little file forceps. That's probably the most commonly question I have. Those are from uh, G. Hartzell and Son. Uh, so just talk to your supplier. We got ours from Henry Shine, but any of the major suppliers will carry them. Uh, don't really I haven't been able to find them on eBay. That's the one thing. That's one time eBay's failed me. <laughs> anyway, you want to do that work. And you can see I'm working down, and we're probably getting to about 16, 17 millimeters about. Um, the rotary file, as you can see, is dropping down a lot farther there. We're almost patent, almost down to the bottom, still buckling there, which tells me there's a little bit of calcification at the apex. And like I said, if you find that you're starting to have that buckling with these heat treated files, take them down the other canals, and that usually straightens it back out and gives you a little bit of that stiffness back. Um, Going back in, you see me do this process over and over again. You want to kind of flip back and forth. I only work maybe about a millimeter at a time. And at this point, we're pretty stinking close to where my working length is on those. So I'm going to go ahead and take a break now. Um, <laughs> not from the video. You'll, 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 you'll be able to see it. And notice that they join. That is why that right there um, is actually why I'm not too worried. A lot of times when those MB2s come in, they'll come in at almost a right angle and you won't be able to get the rotary file around there. So if you find that you're getting stuck, 
Calcium hydroxide also helps soften the teeth a little bit. It makes them sometimes easier to get around any, you know, little spots that may be calcified or whatever, ledges. And so put the calcium hydroxide in. I always start in the MB2 because as you saw, it filled up the MB1 telling me that this is a type 2 canal system. So we are actually good. I don't need to worry too much at all about going back and re-instrumenting. You'll see I will go back a little bit here. Um, but that's what our calcium hydroxide shot looks like. You can kind of see a hint of the MB2 there. And without further ado, coming back a month later. So actually it's a little bit longer than a month. The, cal the cabin had broken down. This is a great patient, but he lives about four hours away. So he, he getting here is sometimes tough. When I remove cavet, you'll see I used the larger prep burr in this time. It's because that's about the size of it. There's no need to be, I, I can just keep it in there. It's a lot faster. So for those of you eagle eyes, you can see that. And in this case, I'm going to go back down with the 2006. He had actually gotten a little bit of food caught in there because it had been about two-ish months, um, unfortunately, and the cavet broke down. So I should probably start using something else there but notice that the mb2 actually went all the way down it was patent this time and that's one of the benefits of using that calcium hydroxide is it's able to soften and remove any you know calcification things like that and it sometimes makes it a lot easier i'm not going to say it works every single time but if you're having trouble getting down a canal take a break, come back with fresh eyes, place the calcium hydroxide. Oftentimes you'll find that it just drops right away. And that's what you saw there. That 2006 went straight to length in the MB2. I know that it joins, so I'm not going to go back and check length. Um, it doesn't matter to me for the obturation because I'm going to use the squirt fill anyway. Here we are doing the final rinse process. Another commenter asked how I get the calcium hydroxide out, and this is it right here. So we'd go through a full thing of bleach, a full thing of EDTA, and then just a little bit of isopropyl alcohol just to make sure everything's nice and dry here. Um, if you can Pretty much I'm looking to make sure there's no debris, anything else coming up. And you'll often find that when you use the endoactivator, it kind of knocks a bunch of crap loose. Uh, the, this one's a small axis, so it's a little hard to see. But generally you'll see that even after going through, you know, three cc's of bleach and activating, there's usually some junk coming out as well. But by the time we get to the isopropyl alcohol, it should be pretty dry at this point. So using that ASI microsuction to dry everything, cones, you've seen all this before. Um, I'm going to skip through a lot of the obturation because a lot of you have... Uh, um, yeah, there's a bunch of videos where I get into it a little bit more, but go ahead and do squirt fill for this one, just like you've seen normally. Um, clean everything up, backfill with the little beta mini. Really nothing too, too crazy here. Um, I think in the last video I talked a little bit about with type 2 canals, you want to fill the straightest canal first. That's one kind of consideration here. So whatever canal kind of felt straighter to you, in this case for me, it would be the MB1. That's the first one I felt uh, filled. And then I am going straight in with the... Uh, pack mac as well you can see those two mbs there just want to make sure we get a nice really solid condensation here it actually dropped a little bit in the mbs so that's a good sign that you were able to fill in any voids and you can see me coming in here right on where that mb2 was filling that in packing everything down and in this case this dentist likes to see these patients back to the fills um, i'm just happy that he's sending patients four hours away for me to work on which is just in fact that's fantastic so that's what everything looks like as far as your mb2 um, hopefully that was a useful case on how to not only look at zirconia in a different way, uh, you know, address it a different way, but also how to deal with these calcified canals. Um, once again, that pro tip of the, if you're struggling, if you've gone and you're kind of getting frustrated, take a break, place calcium hydroxide. Oftentimes you'll be pleasantly surprised and you'll see, just like I'm showing right now, that calcium hydroxide came right back up the other canal showing you that you do have a type 2 system and that you should feel comfortable and then obviously sometimes it works out great and you can you know drop a 2006 right back down and everything's fantastic so anyway thank you guys so much for watching i know this was a longer one hopefully that little uh, side note on uh, zirconia was helpful i found it really interesting when i've learned about this um, so shout out to nate for uh, just being a fantastic speaker um, he's actually coming out to reno next november so I'll, I'll, if any of you are interested in coming out to Reno and possibly meeting me and uh, going to see some great CE, let me know below in the comments. Otherwise, thank you all so much for watching. Um, like and subscribe. Once again, we hit a thousand subscribers. I don't know how the hell that happened, but there's a, there's a thousand of you out here who are somehow okay listening to me chat about something very silly like root canals, but I love each and every one of you. Thank you so much for the support, and I will talk to you all next time.